Now, to be derived from a commencement exercise is, is the inspiration that comes from the address by the speaker of the evening. Therefore, in thinking of a speaker who could bring a message to this class, it was logical that we should s select a person with these outstanding qualities. The United States at their Brotherhood Council. He has done extensive work in the United Nations representing Rotary International. And it is my pleasure now to present to you this outstanding person and speaker, Dr. who will address you on tomorrow is already here. Thank you very much, Mr. Alvis, honorable guests, Mr. McKinley, Mr. Lujan, and members of the class of 1954, Mr. Jacobs, and members of the Board of Education, and Mr. Rovec, and members of the faculty of the Clayton Schools, and my fellow proud parents, and patrons, and friends. It's commencement time again. Each year at this season, uh, thousands upon thousands of words of advice to American youth are printed and orated. And on the whole, I think it's pretty good advice, but we sort of suspect that uh, youth will appreciate it more 20 years from now than they do today. Because these are the good old days that we will be telling about and bragging to your children about. But it's a happy privilege to be here on this occasion. And they say that there are three things that are almost impossible of accomplishment. One of them is to kiss a girl that's leaning away from you. And the other is to climb a high fence that's leaning towards you. And the other is to live up to an introduction. And I wouldn't know anything about the first. And I never had to climb a fence. I always stepped over. <laughs> and I'm terribly afraid that it's impossible to try to live up to the introduction. And I don't think probably I can do what's expected of me here. I want to tell you this story. Maybe you've heard it. I've told it so many times I'm ashamed of it, but it, it illustrates the, the thing I'm trying to say right now. They told me a story down in Nashville, Tennessee at the start of the war about a party of Marines that came in and wanted a recruiting office, and they gave them an office on the second floor of the Capitol building in Nashville, right across from the offices of the state police. Those of you who've been in Tennessee know that the state police wear green uniforms, and it came the first of the year, and a fellow came into the driver's license bureau down on the first floor and wanted a driver's license. And they said, well, where's your last year's license? He said, I don't have one. They said, well, then you'll have to take an examination. He said, that's all right. I said, where do I get it? He said, go upstairs to the state police. Well, the fellow went upstairs. It just happened so. He turned in the wrong door. He got into the office of the Marine Recruiting Office. And, uh, officer looked up and said, can I help you? He said, yes. They sent me up for an examination. He said, okay. Go right to the next room. The sergeant will take care of you. <laughs> well, this fellow walked in. The hard-boiled sergeant looked at him and said, examination? He said, yes, sir. He said, okay, take off your clothes. Stripped this fellow off, they took a stethoscope and listened to his heart, and then they took his blood pressure, and then they made him get out on the floor and do a spread eagle and a lot of calisthenics, and finally the fellow reached over and tapped him on the shoulder and said, okay, bud, get up, put your clothes on, you're all right, sound as a dollar. We'll come out and we'll fill out the papers. Well, he got his clothes back on, his little woozy from the pounding he'd received, and just happened to go out a side door instead of the front door, and he was back out in the hall again. He figured, well, it didn't make any difference anyhow, so he went downstairs and up the counter. The clerk said, how'd you come out? He said, okay. They said, I was all right. He said, well, fine. He said, we'll fill out the license. He started writing it out. He got about halfway through. He looked up at him again. He said, by the way, he said, your wife ever drive that car? 
He said, yes, she does. He said, well, how about a license for her? And he said, well, mister, I was going to try to get one, but I'm telling you, I don't think she can meet the test. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know whether I can meet the test or not. But it... It's a happy privilege to be here, and I'm glad to be back back home. I'm telling you, after coming halfway around the world in order to get here, by plane and by ship and by train, I'm glad to be anywhere, and I'm especially glad to be here. And I think perhaps the peak of a speaker's challenge is to be invited to address his remarks to young American citizens who have, through diligence and hard work and faith, emerged victorious from their first truly great educational test. And it's with this thought in mind that I express to the members of this class tonight a deep and sincere thanks for the honor and the responsibility that's mine this evening. Congratulations to you of the class of 54. And how I envy every one of you tonight. Envy you your youth and your opportunities. And congratulations to the Clayton schools on this class, because here in this group and the millions of other graduates is America's real potential. My compliments and my congratulations to Superintendent Alvis, whom I consider one of America's truly great school administrators, and to his staff. He has seen the Clayton schools rise from a humble beginning to the great institution of today, a living monument to a life of capable service. Not so very long ago, there was an article in the Reader's Digest that I thought very much compared to me this evening. There was a letter in which a commencement speaker received from his son, who was a member of the graduating class. And that son's father had been invited to address the class, and the letter read as follows. Dear Dad, I thought I'd better give you a few pointers on your coming speaking engagement. By now, we all know that we are the future of America, and that we're going out into an unsettled world. Uh, We know that you're speaking to a fine group of boys and girls, and last but not least, it'll probably be a pretty hot night, and we'll all be anxious to get it over with. In fact, we want to get it over with whether it's a hot night or not. (laughs) And a little humor would help. Uh, However, none of this stuff about the Vermont farmer who was glad that his farm had been declared over in New York state line because he just couldn't stand another Vermont winter. Well, of course, I didn't get a letter like that, but I thought maybe that if Kendall had a chance, that's what he would have written me. (laughs) And then, too, because of the fact that our oldest boy, who also graduated from this school, was here on this occasion... And thinking of something to say, I remembered a thing that he dug up and sprung on me one time at a father and son banquet. When we're talking about what the future of a man or a graduate was. And of course you can't always tell the trade of a man by the cut of his coat nor the type of a man that a boy will produce. And I am sure that these youth of today do know that they're the future and that they'll solve in turn probably just as efficiently and probably a lot more so than we have. But this was the question that Donald posed at that time. Oh, where are the playmates of yesterday and the fellows we knew in school? What's become of the studious one and where, oh, where is the fool? And what's become of the orator whose passion it was to recite and the bashful kid who could speak no peace unless he succumbed to fright? And what has become of the model boy who was always the teacher's pet? And where, oh, where is the tough young nut? the one we can never forget. Well, the studious one, so we've been told, is driving a taxi that's old. And the fool owns stock in a bank or two and an airline that spans the globe. And the order that we knew so well is the clerk in a dry goods store. While the bashful lad that we knew has been in Congress for 10 years or more. And the model boy is behind the bars for stealing a neighbor's cow. And you ask me, what are the tough young nut? (laughs) Well, uh, he's a preacher now. (laughs) (laughs) Well, every book that's worth writing sums up the substance of a hundred other books. And all I can do here tonight is to sum up as quickly as I can the world of today as I see it, to try to call a few signals for you. 
And in my preparation for this effort, I have honestly tried to visualize myself on the day when I, too, sat as you are sitting this evening and wished that the speaker would make it snappy. And I have tried to think in the light of my experience since then what a speaker might have said to me that would have been of value to me had I remembered what he said. And, of course, nothing actually is worth hearing unless it's worth remembering. And it's been my privilege to traps around this country a good deal the last few years, about three-quarters of a million miles, from halfway around the world within the last seven days. And I've had an opportunity to do a good deal of observing. And I think that what I have to say should be said and should be pondered by every American citizen tonight, and particularly by every person graduating from our schools. Of course, I know that listening to a speech in which you aren't interested is kind of like driving an automobile with a flat tire. Now, you can get there, but you're not going to enjoy the trip. And so I'm going to watch your faces, and if I think you're interested in what I'm saying, I'll go ahead. If I think you're not, I'll quit. <laughs> I don't want to be like a couple that was leaving a home after they'd spent an evening the wife said, you know, he said, I think our visit with those folks done a lot of good. said, did you notice how downcast and sad they were when we came and how happy and smiling they were when we left? <laughs> <laughs> so I want you to be happy and smile at what I leave, you see. It. I'm not going to try to answer all the questions or anything like that. I doubt if you'd want me to anyhow. Like some kid that came and asked his dad a question, the old man didn't want to answer it. He told him, he said, well, son... I'm busy right now. I said, go ask your mother. And the kid said, no, Dad, I don't want to ask Mother. I don't want to know that much about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that the commencement period, whether it's of school or college, is always an impressive occasion because it does denote the end of one period in our era in our lives and the beginning of another. And in every man's life, there are certain moments or hours or days which in the after years stand out as highlights in the gleaming, uncertain picture. They're gleaming jewels in the diadem of years and turn down pages in the book of time, milestones on the long, long journey. And that's the time of the period that we are now approaching. And we've come to the time of year when thousands of young men and young women leave our high schools to begin life in the practical world. Their former, formal education has provided them with a sort of a map to help them uh, make their way through life. And this map is much like a road map that tells of all the turns and twists along the route, what is good to follow and what should be avoided. Map makers have gathered the experience of those who have been over the road many times before, and the map offers guidance based upon knowledge and not upon guess. And throw, throw aside this map and attempt to disregard its warnings and helpful hints is folly that often brings sorrow and regret and tragedy. And yet even the best maps are not infallible. A flood, a fire, a storm, or repairs may change things from what has been recorded, and there's always the emergency. And in such case, the experience he has gained from his study of the map should stand the student in good stead. And as thousands of young people leave our high schools and say goodbye forever to formal education, they go forth keyed up with messages of inspiration, as been said here in the introduction. And they've been told that they can get anything they want if they want it bad enough and strive for it, that nothing's beyond the mental or physical limitations of the individual who has set his mind and heart upon the attainment of a goal. And that may be true or it may not be true. I wouldn't know. But I think, though, that a person should first decide whether what he wants is worth the effort of getting it. And if the attainment of the goal would require sacrifices that would destroy happiness or permanently injure health or require a whole life of endless struggle, then the goal would hardly be worth such sacrifices. And also one should consider not only the attainment of the goal as the chief end, but the means or the methods of attainment. And the goal must be attained by dishonest, selfish, or thoughtless means which would hurt others and bring unhappiness to many, then it's not worth going after. And so consider first what you want after graduation. 
friend of mine out in California was telling me about driving north on the Pacific Highway one hot summer day. And he overtook a discrepant old hobo, and he had a pack on his back and was wearing a long, heavy overcoat. And feeling sorry for the old, old fellow, my friend stopped and asked him if he wanted to ride. And he said, nope. It don't make no difference to me if I'm here or 10 miles further on when night comes. And the way some people go after things which they are supposed to get done, it would appear that it makes no difference to them if they stay where they are or end up 10 miles farther on. And first, there must be desire. And so consider now first what you want after graduation. There are three things that a man needs in order to realize the fullness of life and its meaning. Every man needs first a faith which will carry him through every storm without fear or despair. And secondly, a goal which, like a beacon light, shall always shine in the distance, and which, like a magnet, shall draw him to it irresistibly. And third, a sense of humor which shall teach him to establish right values. And having this, he will have learned to win and to lose, and he will know that both are life and that one cannot be had without the other. And so in many ways, this is the most momentous graduation in the history of the Clayton Schools. And as the years go by, you of the graduating class are going to remember this date. It's going to serve as a sort of a meridian from which you will measure your life, something like B.C. or A.D. or A.M. and P.M. And you may not remember much of what I say to you tonight, but I hope that you will recognize the importance of this occasion. It's important that you do not lose the ideals and the ambitions and the urges toward achievement which you have tonight. I know a lot of people who could have achieved far more than they have in life if they'd only kept these things in their minds and hearts and not let disappointments and difficulties and disillusionments and ill fortune take away their youthful enthusiasms and goals. And that's, that's why it's important for you to remember this date. And commencement can be a meaningful word in your life. It can mean the beginning of, self, beginning of self-examination. It can mean the beginning of adjustment of a new perspective. And the greatest task that you have before you is to meet yourself tonight and to know yourself and to understand just how much determination you have. I can't emphasize it too much. I wish I could tell you that everything's going to be all right and it's going to be fine as, as you step out on your own, but I'd be untrue to my conscience and to my God if I uh, should attempt to do so. Of course, you let two men walk a mile down the same road to work every day, and one will complain endlessly about the chore, and the other will watch the season change and the comings and goings of the birds and the cloud effects, and you'll soon have a friendly acquaintance with those things along the way. And it's not what we do in life, but how we do it. It's not what there is to see, but how we react to what we see. You want success. First, ask yourself the question if you're willing to pay the price. How much discouragement can you stand? How much bruising can you take? How long can you hang on in the face of obstacles? And have you the grit to try to do what others fail to do? Have you the nerve to attempt things that the average man would never dream of tackling? Are you the persistence to keep on trying after repeated failures? And can you cut out luxuries? Can you do without things that others consider necessities? Can you go up against skepticism and ridicule and the friendly advice to quit without flinching? And can you keep your mind steadily on a single objective that you're pursuing and resisting all efforts to divide your attention? Are you strong enough to finish as well as quick? enough to start. If we could actually look through the window on the world tonight, the view would not be very encouraging. Almost ten years after the war, people are not yet living happily in peace, but a steady menace of war keeps their armies ready and millions of dollars and pounds and francs are being spent for rearmament and weapons and war materials for destruction. Looking through our window, we would see accidents and murders and storms and crying people and helpless children. We should all feel depressed and lost in the chaos of the present world, feeling like one alone in a busy, noisy city. Because the windows through which we generally look are small and we see only one part of the world, 
a very little part only, and only the one to which we are accustomed. But we can no longer afford to confine our vision and our thinking to our own little sphere. Whether we like it or not, America is definitely and permanently tied up with the rest of the world. And sometimes the sun passes behind the clouds and the landscape is darkened. And our international affairs are going through a some such period now. And it's the same old story. The communists are out again after their one world. And the communists took over Latvia and Estonia and Poland and East Germany. They took over Russia and Romania and Bulgaria and Yugoslavia and Albania. And they got their hands on Austria. Then the great area of China was swung to their control. And they now control over 800 million people. And they reach out for furthermore into Indochina and elsewhere in Asia and in Italy and in France. And last week from Tonkin to Geneva, the atmosphere was charged with gloom, and defeatism, and suspicion among the Western allies. And while the communists looked on and sometimes laughed, the West, spent mo the West spent most of the week stepping on each other's toes, complaining and apologizing and explaining themselves to each other. And the relations between the Western allies are at one of their lowest post-war points. What unity there is or was born of irresolution rather than resolution, of recognition of common danger rather than agreement upon common action. But with all this, these are, after all, only the outward and the superficial <coughs> things. Actually, the clash of policies and the clash of moral and armed forces throughout the world today are but the outer evidences of the deeper and the more faithful clash of intellects. The thoughts that flash upon our vision and the shadows that fall across our way are only the faint, far-off reflections of the joys and the tragedies that moves in the lives of thousands and millions of peoples, our friends and neighbors, both at home and abroad. And never before in history have we been faced with a challenge so great and an opportunity so supremely wonderful as that which faces us today. We're standing at the threshold of one of the most breathless and one of the most historical moments in all history. In the death shadows of an old era and in the travail of the present hour, an entirely new era is being born. We're still too close to this gigantic panorama to visualize its mighty sweep, too bewildered to understand the rapid changes that pass before our eyes upon the great universal canvas. And throughout the world on this 21st day of May, in the year of our Lord, what irony! In the year of our Lord, 1954, society is in a state of flux. Forms of government and of industrial and economic systems change overnight. And open powder kegs await only a careless or an intentional spark to cause nations to leap one another at each other's throats. And men who had striven for world power now view the shattered ruins of their hopes. And the things that seem most secure have crumbled into ruin. And the race of men wanders aimlessly amid the widespread devastation, stunned by the force and the effect of the tempest. Some with curses and imprecations railing blindly at fate, and some in stolid despair, and some kneeling in deep contrition and repentance, and some with arms outstretched to the sky while the lightning still flashes and the thunders rumble away into the distance, hoping to see the sun of hope sign again through the rift in the lowering clouds. And in my generation, we fought two great world wars. We fought one war, a war to make the world safe for democracy. And that war left five nations in the world with enough of substance left to do something about rehabilitating themselves and contributing something uh, to the rest of the world. And then we fought a, the Second World War, which was called a war to end all wars. And that war left only two great nations in the world with something of substance uh, capable of contributing to their own rehabilitation and contributing something to the rest of the world. Those two nations are found with conflicting and uncompromising uncom ideologies. And the contrast between the methods of these two great nations, Russia and the United States, are nowhere better pictured than tonight, because this is the commencement period in Russia also. And here in the USA, many thousands of young <coughs> Americans are graduating and are being launched into a, oh, perhaps often troubled sea of life, but they are free to choose a goal. 
And at this time of year, other thousands of young hopefuls will get their diplomas from the state schools of the Soviet Union. And they will emerge in no world of personal doubt. They have no choice of goals. Their jobs and future careers will be assigned to them by the state. And such assignments leave nothing to the choice of the individual. An official committee makes all the decisions. And each young man or woman is directed to the area and to the job where his training could be most useful to the state. And this may mean the assignment of a Moscow youth to a village for far Siberia. And only a lucky few are allowed to stay with their families in their own hometowns. And as a proof that human nature still functions on even the tightest of Soviet controls, there's a crop of scandals at this time of year. Certain parents try to get special considerations for their children. And it's a criminal act to question the committee's decision. It's also a criminal act for any worker to leave his job at any time without official permission. And thus, a young graduate is, graduate's assignment is likely to be a sentence for life. And today, some young Americans may feel that they're stepping out of the shadow of the classroom into a very uncertain world, and some of them may feel perhaps that life owes them a living, and a pretty good one at that. But it would be a rare American graduate who would trade the uncertainties of his future career for the deadly certainty that awaits his young contemporaries in the Soviet Union. And so let your first goal tonight be a determination to persevere in the American way and not to trade our liberties little by little to some form of promised security. And if there be a single one among you who feel that the world owes you a living, let me say be at once undeceived. Everything that you've ever had in the past and everything that you'll ever get in the future must be balanced by something else that you give in exchange. There isn't any substitute for work. Nobody can promise you something for nothing. I think all of us dream of a life of comfort and ease. If we didn't, uh, maybe we wouldn't be human. But the dream of an easy life is a very expensive dream. It costs us a lot of time and trouble that we would otherwise not to have to go through with. It can slow us down on the job of digging ourselves a well-earned foxhole in the economic system within which we are to live. Maybe you're saying to yourself right now, well, this old bird's behind the times. The world's changed from the time when he graduated, the time when everybody had to worry about himself. If you're saying that to yourself, then you can point to a lot of other people in this country and people in high places who are willing to agree with you. And I wish that there was some way to supply everybody with a decent living without requiring of them something of full value, goods or services in return. But the law was laid down not by some human being, but by Mother Nature. There isn't anything or anybody can change it. If you want your father to take care of you, that's paternalism. If you want your mother to take care of you, that's maternalism. If you want Uncle Sam to take care of you, that's socialism. If you want your commerce to take care of you, that's communism. If you want to go out of here with a determination to take care of yourself, that's Americanism. I was waiting at a bus stop recently, and an old lady came by with a load of parcels, and she tried to board the bus, and the conductor said to her, said, let me give you a hand, madam. And the only lady raised her head and said, no, thank you, mister. I'd best manage to get on alone, because if I get help today, then I'll want help tomorrow. And from now on, you're going to have to depend upon yourself. Yes, the moon was white and the road was dark and it was a perfect place to stop and park. And he heaved a sigh and he heaved a groan and he cursed his fate. He was alone. <laughs> and from now on you're alone and you're going to have to depend upon yourself. And all this talk about pull, about getting something for nothing, about the patronizing government that's going to take care of you from the cradle to the grave is strictly nonsense. And today, in the midst of the greatest revolution that the world has ever seen, there's only one unpardonable sin, and that's indifference. There are other sins that are almost as unpardonable as the first, and they are ignorance and selfishness and apathy and indifference, not caring. 
couple of girls sitting in the room, and one of them was reading a magazine, and one of the girls said, well, what do you know? said, it says here that at the age of 75 that there are 18% more women than there are men. And the other girl said, well, at 75, who cares? <laughs> but we have to prepare ourselves now so that in the silently approaching future we are capable of fulfilling our mission, whether it be as a lawyer, a doctor, a housewife, or a janitor, or a laborer, or a farmer, to make ourselves personally strong and to learn to live today as if we were going to live always. I know that a 32-inch television screen and a flashy sport car and a souped-up hot rod, these things are all very flattering to our ego. And a peacock feathered hat, providing that the feather be long enough, might possibly help brush the gates of heaven, but it'll never open them. And so if we deny our responsibility, if we follow the maxim of eat and drink and be merry, then it's not tomorrow that we die. In fact, we are already dead. We hear a lot these days about making America strong, and I'm glad that I don't have President Eisenhower's terrifying responsibility. I don't have them, but I do have my own little job to do, and I'm accountable for how I serve, and I shall be accountable throughout all time, and myself I must first make strong. I think the tragedy of our day is that in an age best equipped for the impartation of information, of any year in history of America, there's an appalling ignorance. In a time of compulsory education, malinformation and prejudice are rampant. And we live in a day of materialism. We have become in America thing-minded. And to say this is not to condemn, it's simply to appraise. We worship the twin gods of mass and momentum. I fear that we very often ask ourselves, how big is it and how fast will it go instead of how important is it and what it's worth? We don't know as much collectively as we thought we did, and science is not as adequate as we thought it would be. And our greatest danger doesn't lie in the size of our atomic stockpile or in the paucity of our planes, but in the fact that so many people today don't realize where our real danger lies. The majority of American people today seem to feel that if they have a good family doctor and a hospital plan and life insurance and a place to live and a deep freeze and a TV set, and a car and some golf clubs and belong to the right club that they can face the future unafraid. And poor, blind fools. They need help and they're in desperate danger and they're sick because they're colorblind to the real purpose of life. I would remind you again tonight that America was founded as a Christian nation. And yet I venture the assertion to this audience tonight that the average American today wouldn't swap his TV set for the best theologian that ever lived. We have crime and corruption and delinquency and the clash of ideologies and chaos everywhere in church every Sunday. We need to remember that pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And are we running in such a race after food and space and employment for the greatest number that we're forgetting the very purpose of America? You who are graduating from our high schools this year have the priceless privilege of being able to continue to better yourself and your state and nation through your own striving, and no form of government can give you more than that. And don't let the prejudices and the stupidities of others embitter you, even as you try to change the world for better. Learn to adapt yourself to the world as you find it, and then strive to correct it. You cannot and you dare not be apathetic and indifferent and indolent in these times. Because the issue today is clearly defined between Christianity and communism, between equality before the law and forced equality under the reign of tyranny. And the battle line is drawn between Jesus Christ and Karl Marx. No matter how many side issues they are, the great and the fundamental issue is between godliness and ungodliness, between Christian living at its best and Karl Marx at its worst. Why am I emphasizing these things? Because I've been over in countries where the headlines of the McCarthy-Stevens quarrel are given all prominence in the newspapers, where every time someone makes a speech criticizing the government of the United States, that it's headlined everywhere, and we're being told how divided we are and how uncertain we are about the future. 
So we need a new unity for America. And all around us these days we're hearing voices of fear, fear of depression, fear of change, doubt as to our business in ingenuity. And great and growing industries are speaking nervously of competition. We're gradually succumbing to a psychology of fear. What's more than that, we began a few years ago to emphasize the problems of our society. We're now living in a sort of a moral vacuum. People in their conversations these days spend more time being critical of their friends and panning them and uh, trying to assuage their own consciences or inflate their own ego by trying to tear somebody else down. And this negative approach to almost everything has tragic implications. Stop and think for a minute tonight. What are some of the things that you don't like about what other people are doing? What are some of the things that you don't believe in? And I'd hate to ask you to make a list. We have let a fear complex and a hate complex come into the lives of our citizenship, and we're replacing our love of God and our love of country with that complex. We hate the men in the Kremlin. We hate what their friends are doing around them. We hate what unwise investigators will do to us here at home as they try to combat subversion or bribery or deceit from within. We hate the thought of depression. I was in a town not so very long ago where they had the, the high school basketball tournament. And it was a hard-fought game in the finals. And after the game was over, the losing team laid for the winning team and beat them up. It was a terrible and a tragic thing. Whenever we have reached the point that we hate the opposing team more than we love the sport, when we reach a point to where we hate communism more than we love democracy, when we reach a point to where we hate Russia more than we love America, if we permit our hatred of Russia to replace our loves, if we let non-Christian idealism replace our love of the Christian dream as a motivation of our lives and the reason for our being, then we have accorded those conspirators who seek to overthrow us the greatest triumph which any dogma can aspire the power to dictate, the power to think even of its enemies. And so that's the challenge that I bring to this graduating class tonight. Because tonight we are in a great conflict with forces that seek to destroy us. And we need a new unity of America and a new determination to see the realization of the American dream. And think not by mere force of arms that this republic attained its present high pitch of greatness. No, but by things of a very different nature, of industry and discipline, discipline at home and absence and justice abroad, a disinterested spirit in councils and unblinded by passion and unbiased by pleasure. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time recalling to you the greatness of America, its heroes and its glorious past. You ought to know those facts as well as I. But I'm quite persuaded that the next 10 years or 15 is going to test this country in its stability and in its sturdiness and its determination to stand steady in its shoes as no decade has ever before in our history. And if I had my choice tonight, I would choose the next 10 years in which to live to be curious and to watch those who take over. No such responsibility has ever been laid upon a nation as now rests upon America. Think of the nations and the generations of people who have lived in comfort in some degree of security, but who have never been close to the pivot point of history. We're not only close to it, we're it. We're going to see in the next 10 to 15 years an entirely new world and a new change. Of course, it may be a thousand years before historians will go back and record it, but it's going to take place in our time. The fact that we don't know the answers, the fact that... Uh, those of us of our generation who wander around in Europe and in Washington and Asia can't find the answers does not reduce the great and unprecedented responsibility and opportunity that's ours. Someone, I don't know who it was, said we should greet the 
future with a cheer and the unknown with a cheer. And I commend that shout to you now, because whatever lies ahead and whatever greatness is past, whatever the opportunities which will appear, never will be they be greater than those which are afforded us now. And my wholehearted gratitude and yours should go out tonight to Almighty God for these boundless blessings and the opportunities which are ours. All of us go from here tonight along unblazed trails. That's the way it's always been, and that's the way it will always be. We can't penetrate the final mystery of things because behind every mystery is always another mystery, and that's the way it's always been, and that's the way it will always be. And someday, someday, somewhere in the next few years or in this year, somewhere out of one of our graduating classes, there's going to be a new national hero who will arise. And his picture will be hung in the schoolhouse, and there will be statues of him in the parks, and streets and highways will be named after him, and courthouses and capitals will close on his birthday. And that person will be the leader who brings America back to the fundamental moral balance upon which it was founded and restores to it a unity of purpose and a determination to persevere. And so no matter how betrayed we may have been by what is past, no matter if we stand pointing accusing fingers at the land our fathers built and blaming our kith and kin and saying that they failed us and holding them in scorn, we are responsible for act and voice to future nations yet unborn. And theirs is the oppor this is the opportunity, and ours is the choice of worlds we leave behind us when we go, so that our children's children unafraid may walk the paths of liberty and know the beauty of the peace of their fathers made. And certainly now is, the not, is not the time for those graduating from our schools to echo the cowardly words of the nerveless Hamlet who said, Oh, the time is out of joint, oh, cursed spite that I should ever be was born to set it right. But now is the time to echo the words of Rupert Brooke, who, sailing for the hard campaign in Gallipoli, exclaimed, May God be praised who hath matched us with this hour. You've been a grand audience. I want to thank you again and again for the inspiration and the help that's come to me as I've tried to watch your faces and I've tried to counsel with you tonight. I am not a prophet of gloom. I don't think America is on the verge of any great cataclysm. I think that once the American people realize their responsibilities, that we can go forward to unbounded new things, new machines. The things we can create in this new age are simply beyond comprehension. That in itself is sufficient topic for another speech. May I present to you my compliments tonight and my best wishes for good health and happiness in abundance throughout the coming year. Health enough to make your work and your studies a pleasure, wealth enough to support your needs, strength enough to battle uh, with difficulties and overcome them, patience enough to toil until some good is accomplished, and charity enough to move you to be useful and helpful to others, faith enough to make real the things of God, hope enough to remove all anxious fears concerning the future. And may I wish you happiness after all the supreme purpose of life, happiness enough to mellow your days and cause your nights to be filled with sweet dreams and pleasant memories. Over my head the stars, distant and pale and cold, and under my feet the world, wrinkled and scarred and old, and back of me all that was, all the relentless past, in the future waiting beyond, silent and untenanted and vast. And I, in the center of all that has been or that is to be, and the world lying under my feet and the stars looking down at me. And I stand tonight at the end of the past. Where the future begins, I stand. And captains may rise again and conquerors may command, but greater than kings unborn or emperors under the earth am I with my chance to test my courage and to prove my worth. And under my feet the world, and over my head the sky, and here tonight at the center of the things in the busy present am I. Yes, tomorrow 
is already here. And as you advance into the new tomorrows, may the happiest days that you've ever known in the past be the saddest days that you'll ever be known in the future. And now, if I may paraphrase a currently popular song, as so long it's been good to see you.